excited to be here today um, on this episode of Growing the Future podcast. We'll be talking with a good friend and colleague, Bill Dorgan, and we're really going to talk about, you know, is carbon the next goal of agriculture? What's going on with the carbon market? There's all kinds of excitement um, going on around, you know, adding carbon to your soil, the regenerative egg, soil health, biologicals. We have the carbon tax on the other side that's, you know, costing farmers money. And then we have the offset system that farmers can benefit from. And so we're going to have a great conversation about where all these um, issues are at. Are we really uh, creating a positive effect on climate change? What farmers should be thinking about and where we're going next in the carbon market. So hope you enjoy this episode with a, a good friend and our special guest, Bill Dorgan here today. Uh, first of all, I'll, uh, I'll let Bill Dorgan, who's in charge of Trimble's aggregation, and maybe you can correct me a little bit on that, but I'll let you introduce yourself, tell us who you are, kind of your background, and what your role is with uh, what you're doing right now. Sure. Um, thank you. Really nice to be with you, Terry, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you. Um, Again, my name is Bill Dorgan. I am born and raised on a grain farm and cattle ranch in southwestern Saskatchewan. Um, my family still farms there, um, southeast of Swift Current, and it's a fourth generation farm there. So I certainly have dirt in my veins. Uh, I went to the University of Saskatchewan and did a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry. Um, and then spent about 30 years uh, plant nutrition, plant protection, plant genetics businesses. And for the last uh, uh, 12, 13 years, I've been working in this carbon space with originally Agritrend and now Tremble. And uh, we work with um, growers in particularly Alberta right now, on the uh, um, whole issue of carbon offsets and offset generations and, and uh, working with farmers to um, create offsets uh, on their farm um, under a global type protocol that's been approved by the Alberta government here. And uh, that's what we do. Uh, subsequent to 2008, we've generated a little bit north of 4 million tons of offsets in the conservation cropping or zero till protocol, as well as uh, beef feedlot cattle, methane and nitrous oxide reductions. And we've returned approximately $50 million to um, Alberta producers. So 40 so, million tons and 50 four, million no, dollars. 4 million tons. 4 million tons. Yes. And, 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 and 50 million dollars has been uh, turned back to Alberta producers. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. So that's one, one of the reasons uh, I wanted to bring you on the call. So I'm just going to get into the kind of topics of the discussion. We'll make sure we try to roll through because I know um, I can talk a lot anyways on some of these things but really I think and I'm, I'm kind of a positive guy I always look, look at you know the glass is kind of half full first or you know innocent until proven guilty so I, I think you know what we're seeing in the industry is just this idea about growing carbon right and and uh, the industry is getting excited about this um, obviously you know, we know that climate change is an issue and we feel that farmers can probably be a part of that. Um, that's kind of the warm fuzzy of, uh, of, you know, helping out in the, in the climate market and producing more carbon from the activities that we do um, and, uh, and generate money as a farmer. And I think this is where you know, we're looking at, um, you see the re regenerative ag themes are coming in, you know, some of that's around reduced chemical, but really it's about carbon, the focus on, you know, soil health and using biologicals or efficiency, um, you know, nutrient efficiency products to, to drive that efficiency. That's, that's really kind of where some of the excitement and the focus and the drive is in the industry that I see right now. 
And, you know, it feels like it could be an exciting opportunity. Um, what's some of your thoughts on that, Bill? Well, um, you're absolutely right in your, your summary. Um, but if we take a step back here, globally, agriculture represents approximately 12 to 13% of greenhouse gas emissions on the, on, on globally. So I'm really pleased and um, happy to be involved with agriculture taking a stand and, and reducing those emissions and in fact, helping the overall situation with soil sequestration of carbon. So farmers recognize, producers recognize that they're responsible for you know a, a pretty good chunk of these overall emissions. So they're being responsible corporate citizens by taking steps to mitigate those, those emissions and that's where we're involved. So there's, there's nothing in any of these protocols that would cause you Terry as a professional agronomist and grower to say, you know what, I don't wanna do this because it's not a good management practice everything in these protocols that we use to develop offsets is a helping the situation and providing um, better agronomy for food production and going to efficiency as you said so that's how i feel about that no that's really good and i mean really the drive here right is climate change it's about you know, having a social license and, and what consumers are demanding. And, and this is what, where, where the, where the market is going. You see just about every single um, large retail food company, whether it's General Mills, Walmart, whoever it is, is looking, um, even the oil companies and stuff, everyone's looking to kind of put a badge of sustainability or um, some kind of program where, where they're doing something that matters theoretically or doing something to help the environment. And I guess, you know, one of those questions that I, that I always wonder is, is this really real? Is, is what we're doing, you know, really capturing more carbon? Are the actions and activities making that change? And is it having an influence or is this just a really nice system to make the bad guys in the world that are polluting the atmosphere feel better about themselves. Is this, is this really real? Is the work that's going on and the tons that are transacted, is it actually making a difference? Yes, it is. Uh, simple answer. It's a two pronged approach, Terry, um, within the ag sector, which is the only place that, that, uh, um, we currently work on this file. Um, it's, it's two pronged. One is to reduce uh, emissions from the soil and from the farm, from the feedlot, that sort of thing. Um, and, and reducing nitrous oxide emissions out of the soil structure under the nitrous oxide emission reduction protocol, which is forthcoming. Um, so it's, it's reducing emissions. And the second prong of that is to is goes to the sustainability uh, piece of this equation in that you and I, if we follow many of these practices, are actually regenerating soil health, bringing soil health up, and it's a limited resource, right? So we all have a responsibility to do everything we can to protect that resource make it more efficient, make it um, sustainable for generations to come. And that's, that's the two pieces of this that I firmly believe, and we are making a difference. We are making a difference. Well, that's, that's wonderful to hear. And, you know, that's sometimes uh, a question that I, that I ask myself, or I think a lot of us wonder or debate in the coffee shop. So getting to the, the other side of the story is I think 
especially for us here in Saskatchewan, because we don't have any program yet. And hopefully it's coming. We've been hearing that for 10 years already. And we always talk about that. But, you know, when you say carbon tax, I think generally speaking, you know, all of us think about, you know, the downside or the negative of that. And, and you know, I was just, just um, looking through some articles actually here last night. And this is one of them, like APAS uh, says carbon tax could devastate egg, right? They're talking about once we get to $170 a ton, they figure it's going to cost 12, over $12 an acre on a wheat crop for the carbon tax. And, uh, you know, obviously the government is looking to do these things because they have all this pressure on climate change and the Paris Accord and whatever it may be. But um, there's also kind of a negative side to the farmer. If, if we're not in the system yet to generate the revenue from creating the benefit, we're just getting another, another finger in the pie, so to speak. We always clean, complain about it in egg, right? Um, this is kind of the other reality that this this is a challenge and a frustration for growers. Yeah, um, you know, you, you're talking two separate and distinct issues here. Um, I wish we could call carbon offsets climate change offsets or something other than carbon, because offsets is like light years apart from the carbon tax issue, right? They're both, they both have carbon in the name and yeah. I wish we could differentiate them, but one isn't tied to the other. So, uh, you know, I can't comment on government's um, response to, um, the whole climate issue with, with taxes. Um, that's not what I do and that's not what I'm familiar with. And I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole, right? Uh, I won't even comment on whether I agree with it or not, but on the other side of the, the issue is the generation of offsets. And if, if the revenue from offsets could help to offset the, the uh, expense of carbon taxes on the farm, then great. But I, I don't tie the two together. Um, trying to be politically correct here, uh, but uh, off carbon offsets are tied specifically to emissions mitigation and sustainability, soil health, all that sort of thing. Carbon taxes are like every other tax. Um, you know, it's a different issue for me. So I just don't want to even want to go there. That's a great comment and, and feedback. And, you know, I never really thought about it that way. And I just did what you, what you described, right? Like I am merging the two things together. Like it's the same issue, but you're mm -hmm. right. It actually is two so totally separate things. I've never quite known you to be so politically correct, Billy. Um, <laughs> usually you're a little more unencumbered with your, with your opinions. But um, anyways, I really appreciate that. And that's like, I agree. Like to me, when it gets into like the government regulation and those kind of things, I mean, of course it's important and we need to understand it and we need to be talking to the right people. Part of what's spurred this um, idea for me as I've recently had discussions with Warren Kading, who works within the Saskatchewan government and a good old farm boy for farm boy from Saskatchewan um, working on this for for us farmers and trying to to get a plan implemented in Saskatchewan that's really going to make sense and be simple and benefit um, but yeah so we, we need to be involved in those things but yeah the rest of it I, I kind of agree and I think the one thing that kind of frustrates me, it just gets back to, you know, maybe more of this public perception is I think sometimes because of that misclarity, we get, we get wrangled into this, this idea or suggestion that, you know, in one way, the activities that we do in the farm can provide carbon offset. But again, the, the contrary end of that is that farmers are doing something not so good or, 
or whatnot. And, and what I always think about for farming is there is no other industry or no other business that there's more of a focus for sustainability and protecting the soil and the business for the next generation. There's no other business that I know anywhere that has more of a focus of, you know, handing it down to the next generation or your sons or daughters or whatever it may be. And so, you know, sometimes I get a little defensive about those type of things because I think generally speaking, 90% of growers out there are not only focused on profitability, they're focused on long-term sustainability of their farm, their soils, their business. And their land. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely, Terry. It's, it's I mean, uh, you know, to quote a, a, an old mutual friend of ours, Elston Solberg, like very soon we're going to have nine or nine and a half billion mouths to feed on this planet. And we can't create any more um, land that's available for food production than what we have. I mean, you don't have to be a nuclear physicist to figure out that we, we better start uh, thinking in longer terms about agriculture here because uh, hungry people are unhappy people, especially with their children. So, I mean, the, the, the whole sustainability thing should have, we should have had more focus on it 50 years ago instead of trying to replenish everything now. Um, yeah. That being said, you know, on the, on the on the expense side of thing with the revenues, income tax was created in the first world war, and it was a temporary issue to fund the war. And guess what? We're a hundred years later, and income tax hasn't gone away. So this carbon tax isn't going to go away either. So we we better do everything we can to address that and if if a farmer in saskatchewan is subject to it all i hope is that we're allowed to have an equal playing or an equivalent playing field so a farmer in the uk should be subject to it or not should be but you know to, to keep things flat with with competitive edges around the world so anyway that's a whole nother issue but um you and I, I believe, and most farmers that truly care about generational transition of these resources, um, I'm glad we're being recognized by regulators that we can play a part in this and that we should be compensated for it. If we're being charged on the, on the tax side, we should at least have an opportunity to offset those expenses with positive revenue at least yeah for sure those are those are really good comments so then this takes us now to like where does the rubber actually hit the road what you know what's going on right now within within the the carbon offset market and where are the opportunities for, for growers to, to capture benefit or what should they be thinking about? One of the things that was interesting or surprised to me when, when I was discussing this with Warren Keating or he was talking, he was talking about how the government's looking at this additionality um, idea or clause, which you know means you know, additionality is a property of an activity being additional it's a determination of whether an intervention has an effect or when their intervention is compared to a baseline. So, and what they're talking about as well is like the penetration rate. So I believe what's happening now, and you can correct me on this, um, uh, Bill, but I've also, you know, seen some articles in the papers about this, but the, the, the current um, zero till carbon offset credit system is changing or, or sliding by the wayside because now the way I understand it is they're saying, well, now like 60% or more farmers are, are doing this practice. So it's not something new. And, you know, once you, everyone starts doing it, they're kind of saying, well, you're not doing anything different now. So you're not getting paid. And I know when I first heard that as a farmer, 
I kind of felt a little, um, a little frustrated again too, but um, why don't you bring some clarity to that and what's happening in, in the market in Alberta and what's, what's coming down the pipe that we need to think about? Well, um, let me refer to Alberta uh, uh, currently. Uh, in 2007, Alberta Environment passed or approved a protocol called the Zero Till Protocol, which in 2012 morphed into the Conservation Cropping Protocol. That's the primary uh, protocol for, and it goes to soil sequestration of uh, carbon dioxide uh, as, as plants exhibit photosynthetic activity. Of course, they're withdrawing CO2 from the atmosphere and storing it, storing it in the soil as, as organic matter, which is carbon, right? So it's, it's a soil organic matter improvement protocol and coupled with that the reduced till or zero till part uh, ensures that there aren't nitrous oxide emissions from the soil structure um, which builds up in the soil as a result of um, microorganisms chewing on organic matter and the addition of nitrogen that every farmer would do to um, achieve better results on his production. So that protocol has been in effect since 2007. And now this whole additionality thing has come up. I want to go back to the origination of the protocol. The government, people have been zero telling in Alberta since 1980 or before. The government made a policy decision that no farmer in Alberta was zero telling prior to 2002 period. So that created this thing about, oh, everybody's starting to zero till now, uh, post 2002, so they can claim offsets. So in, in the interim, the last two egg census reports, farmers are asked, do you uh, practice conservation or zero till? or reduced till 100% of the farmers say, of course I do. Yeah. Right. Cause it's the right thing to do. So the government says, Oh, it's business as usual. It's no longer additional. What they should have asked is, do you practice reduced tillage um, on your farm according to the restrictions within the protocol, which is up to 38% soil disturbance. We've got thousands of farmers in Alberta that say that they're zero tillers, and they are, but they use five inch sweeps on 10 inch centers, as an example, which is 50% soil disturbance. They don't qualify for an offset, right? Because it's not reduced enough. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've got a problem with the data source that the Alberta government's been using here to come to the conclusion that this is um, the penetration rate is higher than 40%. Therefore, it's no longer additional. Therefore, we're going to kill this protocol. I have an issue with that. However, I don't make the regulations. I just abide by them as we all do. So um, all on, all, the point of this is the government can make a policy decision with regard to this protocol anytime they want to allow it to be additional. And there's no scientist worth his salt, no soil scientist worth his salt on this planet that would tell you that soil reaches equilibrium in terms of storing carbon dioxide. It, it will store carbon dioxide forever just like trees do. There's no difference between a tree and a canola plant in terms of soil sequestration, right? So um, that's where we're at. The, the, uh, the zero till conservation cropping protocol is 
it comes to an expiry at the end of this calendar year. Um, in the background though, um, the government of Canada and many um, Department of Agriculture Research and Development scientists are developing a soil organic, uh, um, soil organic matter uh, protocol, which will replace it at some point in time. And the measurement will be um, if, if you continue to zero till, among other things, and reduce soil disturbance, you will build organic matter over time. So that will replace it eventually. And in the meantime, we have the uh, feeding efficiency protocol with which we apply to feedlot beef cattle that's very effective and it's science from all over the world. And um, the nitrous oxide emission reduction protocol is coming back to the surface here, believe it or not. And um, that uh, uh, nitrogen use efficiency calculation done on the farm, that if you follow the four R's of first year agronomy, that you can actually improve nitrogen use efficiency which leads to a reduction in nitrous oxide emissions out of your soil. So that's, that's the next issue that we'll be able to provide evidence that farmers are doing and mitigating emissions on the farm. So I do, although I'm very disappointed in Alberta government's decision to terminate the conservation cropping protocol, there are things coming up that will replace it and allow farmers to continue down this mitigation process road. Yeah, so just to kind of summarize now with all this, where do we go from here? You know, what are the, the types of activities that you believe farmers should and would get paid for, whether it's, you know, um, reduced tillage or using soil testing, variable rate, different products, you know, does a, does a product like biosol created from a waste stream or a foliar zinc made from recycled batteries is, is different products in the future going to qualify for credits? Where, where do we go from here? What should farmers be thinking about when they're looking when these protocols do come out if and when, but hopefully it's more of a matter of um, when not if, but when they do come out um, what kind of things should a grower be thinking about when they're looking to partner with an offset company um, as well? Um, these are all biological offset systems, Terry, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I want to clarify that. If you put up a huge uh, uh, fan on your farm to generate megawatts of electricity, you just go once a year to the meter. Right, and you can see exactly how many megawatts you've um, created of electricity, and then you there's a formula for for producing offsets against an emissionless generation of a megawatt. Easy, but with biological soil sequestration, etc., we need a lot more evidence to quantify the offset being created. So it, it all starts with data. So if, you know, if, if I'm a farmer thinking about this today, I, it, you, it, it starts with data capture. And that's a whole another issue that we can talk about later, but if it, like you can't keep track of this stuff on the back of an envelope. So, Date, data capture and data integrity is that's where it starts and then going further down the road is every activity that you do right needs to be supported by a protocol because you can't just create an offset out of the air it has to be created against a set of rules or a protocol so there are tillage protocols. There are many protocols for many different sectors. We just, you and I, just focus on the egg sector. 
<clears throat> so that's what I'd like to speak to just for a second. So we've got the tillage reduction protocol, the nitrous oxide em emission reduction protocol, methane and nitrous oxide reduction in beef feedlot cattle, and others are being developed while we speak. So it's, it starts with data, then it starts with protocol, or, and then follows up with protocol development. And then that's followed with the regulator or the provincial government needs to implement these policies and protocols so that you and I can go out and talk to our farm partners and, and begin the process of generating the evidence to quantify the offset. Then we will transact those offsets with people that need them. And the resultant sale will generate revenue back to the grower. Or if there's no protocols, as the government set the, sets the price of uh, carbon and emissions, these companies, instead of buying offsets, simply pay into the provincial government as though it's an emissions tax. Nobody wants to talk about it in those terms, but that's what it is. So the, 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 gener or the producer of the greenhouse gases is going to pay somebody. So he's either going to pay the government or the farmer. I prefer it to be the farmer because he's taking some responsibility for his own emissions. For sure. No, that's just awesome comments. So it's good to know that if you're going to participate in the carbon market, um, your chicken scratch on the notepad or your shoebox of records isn't probably going to qualify or get you paid. And I think we all know that. But anyways, it was super exciting to connect with you here again and, and have you share your vast knowledge around this subject. It's just been an honor and a pleasure to talk to you today, Bill, and thanks for, for sharing your insight here. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm flattered that you called me, actually, Terry. I, uh, um, I, I really am, and I, I hope that you and your family are all happy and safe. Yeah, seem to be you, Billy. Thanks a lot. <laughs>